I am I'm here from Reboot, I'm representing a lovely book called Unscrolled, 54 Writers and Artists Wrestle with the Torah. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about Reboot and Unscrolled. So Reboot is a network of cultural creatives who come together to kind of talk about Jewish things and way to reboot them. And Unscrolled is a book that's been about 12 years in the making. It's part of... Um, part of the network and, and we're really excited about it. It was put together by Roger Bennett. Um, he edited the book and the book is, is kind of interesting because it deals with two parts. It deals with the simple interpretation of the text, the pshat, and the drash, the more complex interpretations given by our contributors. Um, and every week at Reboot what we try to do is encourage a conversation for people to keep it simple, um, to sum up the Torah portion in 140 characters or less on Twitter using the hashtag cleverly put Torah in 140, um, and also to go a little bit deeper with weekly prompts. Um, this week we have um, our prompt is if you could dream up a design, if you could design a dream coat, what would it look like? Um, and we invite you guys tonight to share what you think your dream coat would look like um, using the hashtag Torah in 140 or hashtag Global Day. And if you want, you can even tweet us at Unscrolled. And I have my lovely assistant slash husband Joshua at my side, um, kind of helping with that. So, so just let us know. So this week's Parsha, Parsha Vayeshev, let's just sum it up quickly. Envy is a killer, two weddings and two funerals, and Joseph in the big house. So pretty much what happened is that Joseph is, has, this, has these dreams and he's his dad's favorite. Um, his dad even gives him this killer coat called the Gatonet Pasim, or in Broadway talk, a Technicolor dream coat. And Jacob tells, J Jacob is, is, is obsessed with his youngest son at that point. So one day he tells, um, Jacob tells Joseph that he should go out and look for his older brothers in the field. Now his older brothers can't stand him, he's annoying, he's the favorite, and it's just, it's, it's a bit much, this kid needs to get out of here. So he's looking for his brothers, and his brothers say, hey, let's, let's play around with this kid, let's put him in a pit. <laughs> so they, they stick him in a pit, and they, uh, they take his coat, and they say, okay, what are we going to do? Let's, um, should we, let's kill him, maybe... Perhaps. Then they say, now nah, we shouldn't kill him. And this guy, Judah, one of the older brothers, says, I have an idea. Let's sell him to some merchants instead. And so they sell him as a slave, and then they, they take the coat, they rip it, they put it in goat's blood, and they decide to give it back to their dad, Jacob, and say, whoops, sorry, your, your son passed away. Do you recognize this coat? And he says, of course, it's the coat I gave my son. So that's, that's, where, that's where Jacob is. And then Joseph kind of goes through adventures, and he ends up in Egypt um, in the house of Potiphar. And Potiphar has a wife who kind of has the hots for Joseph. And he says, well, and she she's pretty much makes, makes her moves on him, which he's not having. But unfortunately for Joseph, he ends up in, in, uh, in jail because Potiphar's wife told Potiphar about all this. And that's where the Parsha ends. But somewhere smack dab in the middle of the Parsha, Judah, the brother whose idea it was to sell Joseph, kind of leaves, goes on his own, gets married, um, has three kids, and um, then crazy stuff happens. Now, this, is, this story is usually skipped over when you're in Humash class in Yeshiva, like it was for me until fourth grade, when... I'm not going to say his name, but I'll just call him Rabbi Goldesheimer. He decided that he was going to teach us this story in fourth grade that you will be learning about in a little bit. And um, at that time, Pretty Woman came out in the movie theaters, and Jason Alexander's character liked to refer to Julia Roberts as a hooker, and I, I learned the story of Tamar, and I said, oh, she's a hooker, she's a hooker. I kept saying it over and over again, and this was a terrible thing for, for, for this poor rabbi from Lakewood, but I kept saying it, and that's how we get to tonight. So without further ado, we're going to have a play reading of, um, of uh, Tamar and Judah by Emily Louboutin and Michael Tedeschi, and this play was written by um, David Auburn, the writer of Proof. So there you go. Enjoy. Michael and Emily. Do you know the reason you are here? You sent for me. Do you know why? Yes. You know what now must happen to you? I know what will happen. Say it then. I am to be killed. 
Yes. Say as well how. By burning. And say why this must be. I cannot say why it must be. Only what you will say is the reason. Do you dispute this reason? I cannot. Then say it now. The reason is my pregnancy. How many months? Three months. Do you have a husband? You know I do not. Everyone must hear. Do you have a husband? No. How did you come to be with this child? I put on a veil and stood by the side of the road. By harlotry, then? Yes, by harlotry. This is what I was told. I hope with all my heart the reports were false. They were not false. You married my son? Yes. He died. He was killed. He yes. died by fever. The Lord saw that he was evil and killed him. This is what you have always said. I won't dispute it with you again now. You did not want to see it, but it was so. You took me into your household for your son and never saw what he was. But the Lord saw, and I saw. This is not why you were here. To resume, one son being dead, I gave you to my second son. Now we come to him. He too died. He was killed. Oh, and was my second son also evil? No, but there were other issues with Onan. Tell us, please, what were they? I don't think this is the place. What better place? We're all listening. Let us just say that there were issues and leave it at that. Or rather, the issues were the issues. The Lord, let us just say, was not pleased. Two marriages. Leaving you twice a widow. Two brothers dead, no children. That would appear to be the tally. What are we to think? Whatever you choose. Two of my sons dead. Still, did I blame you? No, I did not. I sent you to your father's house. Did you stay there? No. The next we learn you are veiled by the side of the road. I do not deny it. And now everyone has heard. Yes, everyone has heard. But there is something you have not said. Say it now. Your third son. Yes. Promised to me when he came of age. Did you make this promise? I did. Yet I stayed in my father's house. I was not given to your third son. Do you deny it? I cannot. Did you fulfill this obligation to me? I did not. Now everyone has heard. Two brothers married to you, leaving you twice a widow. No children. Two of my sons dead. Who here would condemn me for sparing a third? So, we are left only with the question of your conceiving a child by harlotry, which you do not deny. I cannot. Then what else can be said? Only this. Bring me the things that I gave you to keep. What is this? You'll see. Everyone will see. Whose things are these? They're mine. You do not deny it. I cannot. They are your cord, your seal, and your staff. Where did you get them? Where did you give them up? I gave them to a woman. Who? A woman I met on the road. I do not know her name. What did she look like then? I, I did not see her face. Tell us why. I... She was veiled. A harlot then? Yes. When did you meet her? Three months ago. And why did you give her these things? I, I, I promised her a kid for my flock. Why? As, as payment. Payment for what? She was a harlot. What else? And? I had to send for the kid. Until it was received, she asked for these things as a pledge. Did you send her the kid from your flock? I did. But she didn't receive it. The person I sent went back to the road but could not find the woman. She said there was never a harlot there. So she kept... Your cord, your seal, and your staff. So it would seem. There was never a harlot there, is what they said? Yes. So. I do not understand. How did you come by these things? I received them as a pledge. For I am with child by the man to whom these things belong. She's more righteous than I am.
years ago I had a brother. I had a lot of brothers, actually. Brothers and half-brothers. It was, it was a big family. But this one I'm talking about, Joseph, stood out because he was my father's favorite. My dad just doted on the kid. To hear him tell it, he could do no wrong. And the son more or less shone out of his ass. You'll pardon the expression. And whether it's because Joseph really was all that wonderful, or just because on some level, and, and I'm not saying he was necessarily even conscious of this, he enjoyed the envy all that favor inevitably aroused in others, or some combination of the two. Joseph, I felt, and I wasn't alone in this, went out of his way to sort of emphasize his righteousness to the rest of us and make us feel bad about getting up to the things that young and merry men have always gotten up to since the beginning of time. I mean, a certain amount of drinking, brawling, and fooling around with girls, and some of them tarts. Right, don't misunderstand me. If Joseph had simply chosen not to participate, that would have been one thing. And we probably wouldn't even be discussing it now. It was his bizarre and infuriating eagerness to proclaim his superiority that really rankled. It was, it was aggressive. Example. The group of us would be up at dawn with the flocks, cranky and exhausted after a chilly night spending sli spent sleeping rough in some rocky pasture somewhere, no breakfast, and Joseph would come running up, bright-eyed, just dying to tell us about some dream he had the night before. I mean, you know how annoying it is when someone wants to tell you their dreams? And, and Joseph's dreams, according to him. Who knows if he was making it up or not. It doesn't matter. Would always be something like, he's a sheaf of wheat in the field, and the rest of us are all sheaves of wheat, too. Only, he's the largest sheaf, and we're all bowing down to him. Real subtle, Joseph. So, given all that, it was probably inevitable that some of us the more hot-headed among us, started talking about getting Joseph out of their hair more or less permanently. I mean, I'm not going to take you through all the arguments and all the plotting that went on. That's ancient history. Suffice it to say that at a certain point, we're out in the middle of nowhere, standing over a pit, and Joseph's down in it. And there's a faction of us, a sizable majority of the brothers, that's all for cutting his throat and filling in the pit and calling it a day. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that in the moment I wasn't appalled or shocked at what we were contemplating, or even that I argued against it very forcefully. I was part of it. I let it get that far, and it wasn't just passivity or cowardice that had prevented my stepping in earlier, before we were actually at the point of murdering a brother. I, mean, I carried no brief for Joseph, and had fresh memories of mornings when hungover and Sorbald after a night of degeneracy in some fetid one or more flesh pot, I hadn't staggered out to the field, met the eye of my youngest brother, virtuous, virginal, and smug, watering the flocks by a wincingly sun-dappled stream, and hated the little shit. Still, somehow I managed to propose what I, I guess you could call a compromise. Don't kill him. Fake his death and sell him into slavery instead. Even that was a tough sell with my brothers, but eventually I did win that one. And now it was my turn to feel righteous and noble as we dipped his coat in goat's blood. Sorry, I forgot to mention the fact that he had this ridiculously fancy and expensive cloak that my father bought him. And, and needless to say, only him, which Joseph practically slept in. He was so proud of it. And then we sent the thing home to poor dad, who promptly went into protracted an inconsolable morning. Joseph, we sold to some traders. Why am I telling you all this? I don't know. I guess when Tamar, you probably wondered why I folded so fast when she turned the tables on me back there. I mean, couldn't I have put up more of a fight? She is more righteous than I am, I said. I didn't think about it. It just popped out of my mouth, and boom, that was the end of it. And I'm not even sure I really believed that. Yes, I had slept with a prostitute and failed to recognize her as my daughter-in-law. Embarrassing. And yes, I had broken the pledge I made. Not the goat one, which I did try to fulfill, but couldn't because uh, you heard why. But the one about my third son. And she was probably right about that. She deserved a child by him. Right? That's the way we do things. But on the other hand, the deception, the disguise, 
the sheer brazen manipulation, not to mention the sexual exploitation, it's outrageous, disgusting. I could have made that case. It would have been easy. Why didn't I? I don't know. I couldn't. I was standing there and the spirit just went out of me. I was looking at her thinking, she's pregnant with my child. Or, or children. The midwife said it could be twins. And that phrase leaping into my head, onto my lips, heard by everyone before I was even aware I'd spoken it. She is more righteous than I am. What were we talking about? But, oh yes, Joseph, my little brother. We never heard from him again. No idea where he is today. I dream of him most nights. Right on. Good job, guys. That was really great. Um, so, again, that was David Auburn, the writer of Proof, summing up Tamar and Judah, not really summing it up, but creating a dramatic interpretation. Um, and it, it's really it's really exciting to see all this creativity um, about the Torah, which, you know, for thousands of years there's been a ton of intellectual and, and, and all kinds of creativity, but Unscrolled is really... A fun, a fun book and a good way to get into the Torah. Um, <clears throat> so earlier, I uh, when I was talking with Emily about you know the, this reading and about the parsha itself, she made a really interesting point. She said it seems so disjointed. Um, you know, one minute there's this whole episode of Judah and Tamar, it's super dramatic, super crazy. It's like days of our lives, but in the Bible, um, maybe crazier than days of the, days of our lives. Um, and then, and then there's this this Joseph story. Like, why is why is David Auburn going into Joseph right away? And I said, you know, that's really what the Torah does too. Um, and it's really strange how how some things are juxtaposed together. Um, and but you know, the Mofarsh and the commentators often say that there's there's a reason why everything is placed where it is in the Torah. And I just want to talk a little about that tonight, about why th why this story is placed directly after um, the story of of um, Joseph being sold and, and right before Joseph in Egypt. Um, so, so as I was looking through the Mephorsh and through the commentators, I was noticing that um, there's a comparison between Judah and Judah and, and how he kind of went through this whole episode and with Jacob and Joseph and, and kind of comparing those two stories. So let's just um, talk about it a little bit. In the beginning of the, of the portion, it says that um, J J Judah kind of like went on his way. Um, and why did he just go on his way? Why did he go to this new land, this new area? Because he was, Rashi says he was iced out by his brothers. Rashi, um, 11th century commentator from, where is it, Josh? Fr France or Germany or somewhere in between, depending on where, where the borders Worms. were. Worms. Yeah. Rashi of Worms said that he was out, iced out by his brothers. That really... After um, they saw Jacob's reaction and his heart was broken um, regarding Joseph being in Egypt, Joseph being dead, you know, he didn't know it was in Egypt, um, they, they just really, really were royally pissed at Judah with good reason, and they felt like he needed to take responsibility, and they just were cold to him. Um, furthermore, Sworno interprets that what happened to Jacob, he lost a son. What happened to Judah? He lost two sons. Um, so it's kind of, you know, Judah had to had to grow a little bit and learn to be a little bit more empathetic to other people. And what better way to empathize than through actually suffering yourself? Um, that Katonat Pasim, that Technicolor dream coat, um, it kind of represented who who Joseph was at that point in his life, right? He was his father's favorite. He was the star of the family. You know, he he wore rainbows, all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, and that was really who he was. And in the same way, when Judah um, was approached by Tamar and said, recognize these three items, what were those three items? They were a signet, which Rashi explains was kind of like a ring to give your signature, almost like a, like a stamp or seal, a wrap, which is, you know, next to his manly parts, and a staff, which helps him, uh, you know, walk around. Sforno says that those, a 16th century rabbi from, uh, from Italy, says that those were personal items connected to him. Um, <clears throat> that they kind of, you know, 
some people say, you know, the suit makes the man. Well, in this, in the same way, these items kind of made Judah the person who he was. Again, back, back to that katona at Pasim, that dream coat. Um, you know, he, the, he, it was dipped in goat blood. You know, ripped apart and dipped in goat blood. What did Tamar demand that that um, Judah pay her pay him in pay her in goats? Coincidence? I don't think so. Um, and again, that recognize when when Judah was told his dad, "Look, your son is dead." He used this word hakerna. Hakerna means um, recognize this. Please recognize and. When um, when Judah says when when Tamar approaches Judah with these three objects, she doesn't outright say, "Listen, dude, like these are yours. Like buck up. Like give my child support." No, she doesn't say that. She says, "She says, Hakerna, recognize these things." So again, it's that same language: recognize, recognize, and and for those for those reasons, we see that the Mephorshim kind of think that these two stories are related. Nothing is really by chance. So at this point, I want to keep it simple and go deep. Joshua, has anyone responded on Twitter? Nobody has responded on Twitter? Come on, guys. Hashtag Torah in 140. Um, what about from, from the email I sent you earlier? Are there any from today? Why, yes. So we have um, from Amelia in Princeton. Um, she's keeping it simple. She says, she sums up the Parsha by saying, sibling rivalry, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the favorite of them all? Hmm, good one, Amelia. Um, and again, with our go deep, if you could design your own dream coat, what would it look like? Um, Lisa in Los Angeles said, my dream coat would be made of fabric from all the places I have visited that meant something to me combined with photos of my dearest friends and family. Every time I wear it, I would like I would be like getting a collective hug from all these people in my life. I imagine the photos stitched on top of the fabric like a warm, wearable collage coat. Sounds lovely, Lisa. And um, Amelia, again from Princeton, says glimpses of sequins, sparkles, lace, and beading. Shiny and sparkly, but subtle. Um, Joshua, what would your dream coat want to be? You could think about it. Maybe a Jets, a Jets dream coat or something like that. Um, I think mine would be Technicolor and with lights poking out so that you could see me from miles away. Okay, if you have anything else to contribute, keep it simple. Sum up uh, Parsha Vayeshev in 140 characters or less. Use hashtag Torah and 140 or hashtag Global Day. Um, you can also tweet us at Unscrolled, and you could also let us know how your design of a Technicolor dream coat might look. It doesn't even have to be Technicolor. It could be all black. It could be all white. It could be uh, invisible, right, Josh? Right. Right. Okay. So, um, moving on, let's talk about the pretty woman herself, Tamar. So Tamar was kind of, you know, she she was she was the real she was the real deal. She knew what she wanted, and she, and she kind of went for it. Um, the Mephorshim, and the, they kind of compare her to another lady who had twins in the Torah. Can anyone take a guess? Anyone? Anyone? Oh, nobody's talking to me. Um, Rivka, or Rebecca. So Rebecca, as you may know, she was married to Jacob's father, whose name was Isaac, or Yitzchak, and Rebecca and Isaac um, had a set of, of boys named Jacob and Esav, Esau. So Jacob and Esau, um, they really disliked each other, terrible, terrible, you know, relationship kind of like that, like vinegar and oil, water and oil, water and oil, vinegar and oil is delicious. Um, so they really disliked each other, and um, you know, Rivka's kind of known in the story as sort of helping Jacob manipulate his dad into giving him the birthright blessing. Um, and you know, growing growing up, I was always taught that you know she she knew what was right, and therefore it was okay for her to do it. A lot of people are kind of uncomfortable with just reading the the plain text, you know, reading the shot of the text. It, it, it kind of in, a, in our day and age doesn't really feel 100%, um, you know, wonderful. But let's just do a quick comparison um, between Rivka and Tamar. Um, so Rivka was brought into the house of Abraham after the death of Sarah. Um, 
Sforno points out that Tamar looked over at Judah and she said, she, she, you know, it was after two sons were, were killed um, or died. And um, Tamar thought that, Tamar thought that, um, that she would be brought into the house of Judah after his wife died, and his wife unfortunately died, and what happened? She was not brought in. Therefore, she knew that Judah wanted nothing to do with her. He didn't want to have her be part of his family. He was, he was kind of done with her. Um, and I think for people who have children, not, not myself, but you know, you can maybe understand that if two of your kids marry one lady and they both pass, they, they both pass away, you know, you may not want um, the third one to marry her. Okay. Speaking of those two boys, it's not really clear from the text what um, you know what is what's actually happening and why they died. The commentators say that they were uh, still in their seat a little bit too early and they wouldn't impregnate her. Um, the first one just didn't want to impregnate her, and the second one um, he didn't want to impregnate her because it would be like she would be giving birth to the soul of her of his dead brother which is kind of uh, there's all this intense talk about how souls pass away and and it's too much to go into tonight but uh, you know she just wanted to have have a baby she wanted to to kind of fulfill her destiny and this is what she saw at, that it was but they they were not willing to do that and according to the eyes of the Lord it was not okay um, Rashi points out that Rifka went full term with her babies and Tamar only went partial term Another thing that is pointed out by the commentators is that the word teomim, which means twins, when referring to Jacob and, and Esau, it says tomim. The, there's missing that letter aleph. Whereas it, with Tamar, both of those, with Tamar, it's teomim. We complete, the whole word, word is complete. What does this signify? What's the difference? That both of those boys that were born to Tamar Oh, I didn't tell you, she gave birth to two boys, Peratz and Zerach. Um, they were both tzaddikim, okay? So they were both righteous people. But more than that, um, because because Tamar kind of went after what she wanted, she became the mother of the future kings. Um, David HaMelech is said, King David is said to have come, not King David, King David? Yes. Yeah, King David is said to have come to her, from her. Um, and Tamar's story is interesting because, um, for a few points. One, how did Judah not know who his daughter-in-law was? Like, I mean, he knew her, but I guess he didn't know her in the biblical sense, but then he did. Anyway, but, like, how did he not recognize her? So, so again, the Mephorshim say that she was at the corner of the road, and, and, and her face was uncovered. So if her face was uncovered, wouldn't you think that he would know her um, or recognize her? But in that in that day and age, I guess women covered their their faces more, and so he never actually saw her face in in her household. Um, she was always modestly covered um, in her household, and um, and so therefore, when he saw her at, at the corner, he didn't he didn't know her. Um, and after another interesting thing about the story is that after they had kids, um, she, they you know they didn't really interact again. They um, they. In the, in the biblical sense, I mean. Um, so she just, you know, the, he didn't want anything to have to, have to do with her, and, and I think it was vice, vice versa. Um, she just wanted one thing, and that was to get pregnant. She had an incredible focus, similar to Rivka, um, in, in terms of what needed to be done and kind of having a clear sense of what was right and what was wrong. And she kind of moved ahead, forged ahead, and she got the children that she wanted. She wanted to have children from Abraham's family. She knew it was a good family, and she wanted to have Judah, Judah's children, maybe, you know, from actually his children, but not them. Yeah, but, that, you know, that's, that's the way the world works sometimes. Um, so another thing I mentioned earlier, Peretz and Zerach. Um, so that, that, it's really interesting. I was reading the text, and I was actually having a lot of trouble understanding it. I mean, I, I'm not a gynecologist, but it just seems all kind of kind of crazy with, with, with what happened. But um, pretty much Zerach 
said, I, you know, was about to come out. He put his arm out. The midwife put a red string on her hands, red string, um, to, to let it be known that he was the older one. And then he pulled his hand back in. And then Peretz kind of jumped out, leap, leapfrogged in front of him and was born. Um, but Zerach, nonetheless, was, was the... Um, was the older son because he, you know, he he was out first. His hand was out first, um, but and parrot and parrots kind of they call them parrots because it's like he popped out. Um, so Esav and Yaakov, on the other hand, were were different, right? So Esav was the firstborn, and Yaakov kind of grabbed onto his heel, trying to move forward. Let's compare those two. You know, Esav and Yaakov, they were almost fighting to get out. You know, there was a physical altercation with Peretz and Zerach. Zerach almost, you know, opened the door for his brother and said, come on it, come on out to this world. My hand's been out there. It's great. It's awesome. So um, Peretz and Zerach kind of have this nice thing going on, even, even as infants. And I don't know if you saw on the Internet, there's a really cute video of infants who are twins who don't really know that they're born yet. You should watch it. Separate story. Um... So, so that is that is Peretz and and Zerach and and Esav and Yaakov, and out of Peretz came David and Melech, and uh, Shlomo and 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 everyone else, Solomon, um, Joshua. Any more go deeps or keep it simples? No. <laughs> okay. Um, but we encourage you to participate weekly. We have weekly prompts. Um, visit unscroll.org to learn more. Um, unscroll.org slash engage for those keep it simples and and uh, and go deeps. So so we have a lot going on every week. So in summary, um, I wrote on my notes. Tomorrow was awesome. Um, as Cheryl Sandberg said, she was somebody who leaned in. She saw what she wanted and she went for it. She wasn't going to let people say, you know, oh, you should just be a widow for the rest of your life. She knew what was right. And, you know, at, at that time, it was totally different. It's not like now where, where that would end up on Jerry Springer. I mean, it was expected of Judah to take care of his business and of his household, and he didn't follow through. And she just had to do what was right. Um, and just like Julia Roberts, she was a class act. She was. She inspired better in Judah, and she, and she you know, got, got things rolling and, and made things right. And it is from her that we learn that... Um, that we shouldn't embarrass people for for if if they do wrong to us, we shouldn't embarrass people. Where do we learn that from? When she says that Hakerna. She doesn't call him out, Judah, but she says recognize this. So we, we learn we learn that from her and, and the same reason why I, I, I gave Rabbi Goldesheimer a new name. That's not his name. Uh, <laughs> um, also people might um, have looked at her funny and she wouldn't she wouldn't let her stop they wouldn't let her shop on the Rodeo Drive of, of wherever they were at the time, but she was she was a good person and worthy of saying Seed Kami Mena. She's she is more righteous than I. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna open it up for any questions. Um, if anybody has has anything to ask about Unscrolled, about this Parsha, um, I'm really curious to hear about what people have to say. So please feel free to to um, share your comments. Anybody have anything to say? Anyone? Okay, so let's um, let's continue this uh, this conversation. Um, <laughs> Hey, Dina? Yeah? We've got a question here. Yeah. Uh, the question is, so what would have been the Rodeo Drive of tomorrow's time in the Bible? Oh, that's a good question. Like, when, when, what were the sort of things that she would need to do? Like, Rodeo Drive is kind of a, you know, a fancy place where the upper echelons go to be seen and to do all their, like, not normal shopping. Right. So what would, what would Tamar have been looked at? by women of like a higher class or a higher status than her. You know, I think she she was all decked out in widow black. Like she was you know, I think of like Jackie O and I think of like like um, you know, 
mourners, mourners in Italy with like the black lace, almost like that, but probably thicker fabric. Um, so you know, people didn't want to have much to do to do with her. Um, and I think I think that's that's kind of you know what where she was at. She she was kind of persona non grata, like like uh, it, was, it was a bad situation for her. Any other questions out there? Yeah, we have a question from a viewer in New Jersey. She wants to know, so if the story of Tamar and Judah played out today, what would that look like? What What are some parallels that we can draw to uh, the way we behave reacting to each other and, on well, scrolling this page, how we react to each other and what our responsibilities are towards each other? That's a really interesting question. You know, I, I don't think it happens as much today um, as it did back then where people remarry, but where, where people remarry other members of their husband's family. Like, that's just not so much done a lot. Um, but I, I think, um, you know, to, I think it's about supporting supporting other people and, and looking at looking at people who might need a little bit more help in this world and kind of giving out giving out that that help there's all kinds of you know single moms in you know all over that that really um, that really need 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 that community help or you know it takes a village so I think I think that's kind of interesting um, and an interesting way to to take the story and, and make it our own for today um, not just single moms but every everybody needs a little help out there um, and it's not about you know being judgmental about what people have done in the past but kind of helping them move forward yeah so um, I got a question here a little talk a little bit about more about unscrolled um, so unscrolled oh and Josh had a great point <laughs> Josh had a great point. Josh said it's we have maybe thinking about politicians and sex scandals, right? So, um, like, you know, that was like a Judah was kind of like a big macher at the time. So maybe, maybe thinking about those those women a little bit differently. Is that what you're thinking, Josh? Or 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 the men and their reaction and the men and non reaction. The men and their reactions or non reactions. So, um, just just to tell you a little bit more about unscrolled. Um, there's a ton of a ton of great um, great kind of commentaries in here, and um, the way this started was Damon Lindelof, the creator of Lost, saw the the Binding of Isaac. Um, he didn't see the Binding of Isaac. He 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 saw the story, and he saw he said that's kind of like a little strange. Um, let's let's talk about it. So there was a discussion about it, and and you know. It, 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 the people decided it was really strange, and so um, or they weren't comfortable with it. So they created this this book, Unscrolled, to kind of as a reaction to that conversation. Um, and you can look in this book. There's Damon Lindelof's um, take on Unscrolled. It's a conversation after the Binding of Isaac that deals with um, that deals with is is. Abraham really okay mentally, um, and it brings up a lot of great issues. Um, I can also show you some really groovy infographics um, and artwork. So here we have a fabulous take on the tabernacle in Bryant Park, um, and what what the Mishkan would look like, what the tabernacle would look like if it was in New York City. Um, other things that that are in here that are really great. Um, that are super exciting. Moving a lot later on is the um, is is a there's artwork that deals with you know kind of death kind of death and thinking about Moshe as he's not allowed to go into the the Holy Land um, of Canaan, then Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. Um, there's A. J. Jacobs' take on Something we all think about, shotness. Like why why is God uh, micromanaging the process of what we wear? Um, and 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 it's there's really it's 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 a ton of fun to look through. I mean we, Josh and I have been looking through it every week, kind of thinking about the Torah portions. Um, but there's 
it's it's really it's really kind of exciting to to think about that. Um, and um, yeah, what else can I tell you about this? There's a c cartoon coming up in the next week about Joseph reinterpreting dreams. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of exciting exciting things happening, and it is available online. Um, it's available online, and um, I encourage you guys to participate in the conversation, Torah in, hashtag Torah in 140. And, um, I, you know, I also encourage you to check out other Reboot projects. We have the National Day of Unplugging coming up March 7th and 8th, 2014. And we have um, Beyond Bubby, which is a website that shares recipes and stories, six word memoirs on Jewish life, and uh, 10Q, which is a reflection project. But right now, um, I'm going to sign off, but thank you for unscrolling, and I hope um, you can follow us on Twitter, at unscrolled, and, uh, and, and hashtag Torah in 140. And don't forget to keep watching globalday.com global day backslash 24 by 24. You can watch online anytime and watch this, especially this ending, um, which was really exciting. <laughs> um, but thanks, thanks a lot, guys, and, and it was great learning with you.